Good morning. morning. Welcome to Northmont. Thanks for being here this morning. Uh, You know how uh, if you've been here, uh, okay, if if you've been here on like Christmas Eve, sometimes I'll say something like, um, "You want this? You want to go to seminary because this is a a great view because everyone's got the candles and everything like that, and it's it's just you don't get the same effect unless you're standing here when all of that happens, uh, which is uh, just always awesome." But you want to be here when people play bells and you can watch the little things that happen that maybe you can't see. Uh, like what's, what's happening with Sue and Steven and, and all that fun. It's very fun. So I do, again, um, let me give you a plug. Uh, any seminary you like, but um, uh, think about it. Um, before I have you meet and greet, I do want to thank you. Uh, I just noticed in, in the bulletin that the flowers are for me and for pastors who are uh, being appreciated this month. So I thank the Englishes for, uh, for all of their um, good tidings and love. Uh, so with that in mind and with that in my heart, uh, let us stand and meet and greet with one another. I would tell you to sit, but I don't want the soup lady to get bad at me. Oh, man. I bet you when Bonnie was a kid, she never thought for Halloween she'd go as a soup lady. That that wasn't going to happen. But here we are. I understand. So can we have another, uh, we're starting the, uh, we're uh, starting a new era here. Uh, we have the Rob Frankenberry uh, uh, Bell Choir era. And so just another uh, round of applause for our, our Bell Choir, please. <clears throat> um, all right, just a couple of things for you to know as you move forward in your week. And then I know I have some folks who need to say a few things. Uh, first, um, if you are participating in Trunk or Treat, uh, just know that it's still happening regardless of the rain. Uh, it'll be inside, so you could, all your costumes or whatever, anyone who you're bringing, their costumes will be fine. Uh, and so Trunk or Treat is still from 4 to 6 p.m. at Highland, and um, it'll be in their uh, fellowship hall. So it'll all still be going on, uh, but they're, they're aware of the rain, and they've made adjustments. So just know that that is true, and I'll send out a one call or something just to let you know. Uh, That's from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. today, just so everyone is aware. And I'll be there. I think I think I'm the staff representative at of uh, Northmont there at uh, at that event. Uh, Two, um, uh, this is uh, Pledge Sunday, and so just in case this is you haven't been here for Pledge Sunday before, uh, this box. I don't know the whole history of this box from Malawi, um, but it's the box that we use for pledges. And so uh, if you'll notice in your uh, bulletin, kind of like two-thirds the way there, right after the sermon, there's a hymn, and then there's something that says dedication of pledges. When the hymn begins, when the hymn begins, that's when everyone stands and comes up and gets and puts their pledges in. So people will be singing and and what have you, 
And so you'll be bringing up your pledges, and the box will be here, and, and then you'll go back to your seat and continue singing. Okay, so just aware that that is what, what, we're, uh, what our tradition is. Third, um, are you going to talk about All Saints? Okay, uh, he's going to explain All Saints, uh, and then, but um, you'll want to explain the fact that there is how the recording thing works and why that's true. Okay, go ahead. Next week is All Saints Sunday. If you were here last week, last year rather, we sang the Durafle Requiem with orchestra. This year we'll be singing the Foray Requiem. Uh, it was very beautiful service. I think many, many people found it meaningful. Um, it will be a, a regular communion service with this, with the mass, the Foray, the Requiem, the funeral mass sung during the service. Um, if you've had loved ones die in the past year, particularly, that you would like to have named in that part of the service, please contact Jen this week before Wednesday so it can be added to the bulletin, to the list of names. Um, if you are unable to be here in person, know that it will not be recorded so you either must be in person or watch it on the live stream. There's no live stream. There is no live stream. We haven't had a live stream in a year and a half. Two years, maybe. So that was just, that was just a, an well, error in the bulletin. Be there or be square. Stream. Right. Uh, but, but, yeah, for a variety of reasons, we cannot record it. So I hope you can be here in person. It would be with orchestra and the choir slightly augmented, and it's, it's a very beautiful piece of music. I think I'll be doing the first look this week explaining a little bit about the music that might be helpful to help you engage mentally and spiritually to the whole thing. So, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, um, so just, again, if you're watching this at home and you're used to uh, participating in worship online, just know that that won't happen at the same time. We'll probably do something um, like a smaller kind of thing, uh, more uh, of a uh, reflection that maybe I do sometime during the week and I post uh, during the weekend, but it won't be the service that you'll see here. So if you are able to make it here in person, um, and because of course the music will be wonderful and we'll be having communion together, uh, please know that, uh, tr please try to be here in person. Okay, I think that that's all that I have. And so does the soup, hold on, you're, you're, you're last. Does the soup lady have anything or did you do your thing? <coughs> You're good. You, okay, we don't want to step on the toes of the soup lady. All right, so now we have uh, Ted Mills, uh, who's going to be giving us uh, his report on all things session. Good morning. I gladly defer to Bonnie any time. So. so this is an update to the congregation from our last session meeting, which was on Tuesday. Session reviewed the responses from the October 22nd town hall meeting where about 50 people were in attendance who provided good and useful input. The responses were, will be made available to the congregation and I think they're actually they're in the narthex. In, they're, in in the narthex. They're, on a, they're on sheets of paper in the narthex where the bulletins are and there's a little baby sign that says something to that effect. Over the next couple of months, they'll be reviewed and discussed in greater detail by the committees of session and within session, with follow-up actions being taken as appropriate. More information will be made available as this process progresses. Stewardship and Finance reported end of year, uh, September, end of September, year-to-date revenues of 275,000, which was about 22,000 under budget due mostly to pledge under fulfillment and to no endowment fund transfer being taken in September. Year-to-date expenses of 317,000 were about 10,000 under, bu under budget. The net year-to-date deficit was 43,000, which is about 12,000 worse than the budgeted year-to-date deficit, uh, projected deficit of 31,000. Session approved a number of motions, including requests from uh, to allow Northmont's Troop 335 to sell holiday greens to the congregation uh, last Sunday. The request by spiritual formation, which session appro had approved by email on October 2nd to collect food donations from the congregation uh, through an advent, uh, advent activity to benefit North Hills Community Outreach. 
and a request by facilities management for North Hills Community Outreach to utilize the kitchen and fellowship hall on Saturday, February 17th next year. Spiritual Formation reported that a confirmation class is to be held in coordination with the other 319 churches with participating youth being confirmed in their own churches at the conclusion of the class. The Mission Committee reported that the International Partnership Committee of the Presbytery is asking for volunteers from congregations to host visitors from Malawi or South Sudan in May of next year. So anyone who might be interested in helping uh, should contact uh, me for additional information. The work of the nominating committee has begun for filling open leadership positions for 2024. Anyone interested in serving should contact either Ann Lineberger or Ben. Worship and Music reported that the confessions banners will be taken down shortly and the hanging of the Christmas greens will, will take place thereafter. They also noted that because, of, because the fourth Sunday in Advent will be Christmas Eve, there will be two services that day, regular worship at 10 a.m. and the Christmas Eve service at 3 p.m. Uh, these highlights and session meeting notes, as well as Stewardship and Finances' more detailed analysis of our finances, and also the digest of the recent September 28th Presbytery meeting uh, are available in the session binder in the narthex, or you can ask me and I can get you a copy. Those Presbytery meeting notes, I, I, I've uh, taken to, to including those with the, the, uh, ta under the tab for the month that they were held in. So this one was in September, so you can find it under the September tab. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Anything else for the good of the order? So let us begin our time of worship together. Please stand as you are able and join me in the call to worship. Lord, you've been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, wherever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past, or like a watch in the night. Satisfied in the morning with your steadfast love, so that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Come, let us worship God.
with you. Let us pray. Send your Holy Spirit into our hearts, O God, to rule and direct us according to your will, to comfort us in all temptations and afflictions, to defend us from all error and lead us into all truth, that we, being steadfast in the faith, may increase in love and in all good works, and in the end obtain everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. And now please join me in our call to confession. Reformed and always reforming, we are keenly aware of how we fall short. Every day, we are reliant on the compassion of the Lord. Let us turn toward grace once more, first together and then silently. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you, heart, and mind, and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us amend what we are and direct what we shall be so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name, amen. Let the favor of the Lord be upon us and prosper, prosper for us the work of our hands. O oh, prosper the work of our hands. In Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. So today is Reformation Sunday, along with being Pledge Sunday. And Reformation Sunday probably doesn't send tingles up your spine, and that's perfectly fine. I get that part. But one of the things I think that is um, a part of what I hope to do in this season, as we've been talking about who we are, who we've been, uh, where we're going, that kind of identity kind of look, is try to give us some sort of understanding of why we do any of what we do, including the, the banners that you see around you. But it also is about what those banners represent. And if you look in your bulletins, you'll see for this morning that under the, the title Affirmation of Faith is something called the Scots Confession. And that's called the Scots Confession because it's Scottish. Uh, so it, it's that, it's 500 years old, and it's one of the earlier confessions, and, um, and so some of the language is a little bit different. So what you'll notice in there is that it refers to something called the Kirk. Now that is not a, a Star Trek reference. This is, um, although I guess it could be. Um, the, the Kirk is the church. That was the term for the church. It also has the term Catholic, and then it explains the word Catholic. Uh, so Catholic was a word that meant universal, and we still talk about that today in the universe, in the, uh, sorry, excuse me, in the Apostles' Creed when we talk about the universal church, the Catholic church, small c. The Catholic church, big c, took that term to use we are the universal church in um, sort of against the Orthodox Church, which is saying we are the right church, we, are, we have the right theology, we are universal. There was something that was kind of combative there. That was a thousand years ago. So now we continue to think about the worlds in which um, all of this uh, came to be. 
And we look around the room and we see a, a lot of common themes. We see uh, crosses and we see water and we see chalices and that, that type of thing. And then we get to this corner over here. And you can't see it on camera. Um, it's, it's, that's a little intentional because it can be striking. Um, but this uh, one in the corner, which is next to the Confession of 1967, which was uh, uh, made in, um, uh, at a time where very intentionally the church was wrestling with what, um, what the, uh, sorry, my, my world just blanked, 1967, and we were talking about the um, civil rights movement. Jeez, I couldn't think of the word, the term. Uh, we were talking about the civil rights movement in the 60s. And so um, a, a confession was written uh, to talk about that from a church perspective. Well, 30 years before that, uh, the Barman Confession was written. And so it has this swastika on it, which is, has a big red X on it, and then the cross that we know. And all of that, uh, whether we're talking about civil rights or whether we're talking about um, you know, fascist regimes, um, are the church paying attention to the world around it and trying to understand how it fit into that world. Whether we're talking about the universal church, whether we're talking about uh, our, our statements about who we are in the face of evil, those are the things that we do. And that can be a challenging thing for churches uh, because the church in some ways feels like I need a reprieve from all of what I see around me. Or I need a way to speak about all the things I see around me. And we're seeing a lot of things around us right now. And we're a part of that in different ways, and we respond to it in different ways. And depending on the church you were in, you would hear people talk about it in different ways. But the point of what we do here is so that not only that we can worship God, but the part of the ways that we worship God is by engaging thoughtfully in the world around us. Because our faith is not isolated to this room. We do missions for the same reason. And so part of what we do in this, in this space, is, especially as we talk about the greatest commandments, is that we take those learn, that what we learn and what we praise, and what we do. And we go out into the world to try to understand how it is that I am going to engage with what's happening around me. We see what's happening in the Middle East. We see what's happening in Maine. We see uh, what's happening in Congress. We see what's happening all around us and trying to figure out what on earth that we do with it. Now, I know that all of us are going to do different things with that. But the point is to try to center us over and over again, confessionally, with words of affirmation, with words of love, to prepare us to do that work, to prepare us to engage each other in those conversations, to engage our families, to engage our communities in those conversations thoughtfully and with compassion and empathy. And so these confessional banners are our history when it comes to that engagement. That isn't just a thing that pastors do today because that's like the thing to do. It's the thing that we've always done. And so my prayer for us as we continue to figure that out is to always come back to those essential tenets of who we are. So I ask if you would pray for that with me. God of hope and love, God of empathy and compassion, God of strength and humility, we ask you here this morning to continue to engage with us because we are flawed people and we are broken people and we are opinionated people. We have thoughts and understandings about the world and where we've been and where we're going. And you, in your infinite wisdom, choose to continue to engage with us as flawed as we are. And we go out into the world to engage with it as flawed as it is. We are flawed, it's flawed. And yet, you engage with us all. You love us still. Your gracious is untethered and amazing. So we thank you for all of those times and all of those moments when we can step back 
as we're trying to decipher the world around us and we're trying to decipher our identity in it, that he would fill us with your love, compassion, and hope. We pray all of these things in Christ's name. Amen. Our first reading is from the book of Leviticus, chapter 19, verses 1 to 2, and 15 to 18. You can find uh, this in your Pew Bible on page 106. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel, and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. You shall not render an unjust judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great. With justice, you shall judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not profit by the blood of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate in your heart any one of your kin. You shall reprove your neighbor or you will incur guilt yourself. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And this is the word of the Lord. in him and not be afraid for the Lord is my stronghold and my sure defense and he will be my savior surely it is God who saves me I will trust in him and shall draw water with rejoicing from the springs of salvation and on that day you shall say give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name surely Cry aloud 
inhabitants of Zion, bring out your joy for the great one in the midst of you is the Holy One of Israel. Surely it is God who saves me. I will trust in Him and not be afraid. For the Lord is my stronghold and my sure defense. And he will be my Savior. Surely it is God who saves me. I will trust in him and not be afraid. For the Lord is my stronghold and my sure defense. And he will be my I don't have a joke. That's just really, really good. That's just really, really good. Our second reading for this morning comes to us from Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 through 46. <clears throat> Here again, God's word. When the Pharisees that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second one is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them this question. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? And they said to him, well, the son of David. And he said to them, how is it then that David by the Spirit calls him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? And no one was able to give him an answer, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. My friends, these two are God's words for us this morning. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> So here at Northmont, we work hard and we play hard. At least that's what Ted Mills always says. And we like to keep things light when we can. And what better time to do that than on Reformation Sunday? This is the day where, for some of us, we really like to let our hair down and think about the following light subjects. Total depravity. Unconditional election, limited atonement, we get wild with that one, irresistible grace, and the perseverance of the saints. Now, if you have hung around in Presbyterian circles long enough, you may know the acronym that goes with those five ideas. It says in my notes, pause for response. <laughs> Tulip, you may have heard that, tulip. Total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, perseverance of the saints. And it's the shorthand 
for some of our core concepts. And I'm pretty sure I, Jill can tell us this. I'm sure, pretty sure that Pat Kelly got a tattoo of those whenever he was teaching <laughs> Sunday school. He just kind of showed off the kids. Okay. Anyway. Yes or no? Where is she? She left. Of course she did. It's the kind of list of ideas that you could spend a lot of time diving into, any of those things I've had basically classes on. There's the intricacies of election and predestination, and that gets heavy. There's the ramifications of grace and salvation. But at their core, at their core, for all of the language and all of the confessional statements and all the things that we could say about all of that, all of those things are really just a way of stating clearly that God is the author. God is in control. It is God that we have our full faith and reliance. All those things really come down to that. Everything we do, whether it's in worship or in our daily lives, spring from those ideas. And when we think about our history, our history really only has an effect when we choose to pay attention to it. It's relevant to our current circumstances, whether we like it to be or not. Our history always leads us to our present in some way, shape, or form. But how it shapes our future is based on the power that we give it. What will we continue to embrace? What will we let go of? What lessons do we take from it? How do we learn from it so that we might be more and more faithful. Getting familiar with our theological past helps us to understand who we are today. I mean, look, you're already sitting here. You already chose to be here. You could have been in another church. You could have been at First Watch. It has great avocado toast, by the way. You could have done any of those things. But since you're here, I might as well remind you of why. And I'm going to give you two examples of why this background that we talk about is foundational to what we do, sometimes even without us thinking about it. Two examples. Example number one. The question that I get the most as a pastor, at least in terms of why do we do what we do, I get lots of questions, but the why do we do what we do question is usually pertaining to baptism. Other churches only perform baptism when the, the person wants to receive it. They raise their hand and they receive it. So why do we do it when the person is too young to remember? I get that often. Well, that tulip thing that I talked about that Pat Kelly has on his arm talks about that in some way, shape, or form. So the principles of why we do that are at least 500 years, if not longer. In our tradition, baptism has really little to do with choice. It's not really about choosing something. We firmly embrace the idea that we do not save ourselves. We do not earn grace. We cannot say yes to it. We don't earn faith points and then turn them in like frequent flyer miles because if any of that was up to me, the plane would crash. It's not like Cole's cash. Christ doesn't work that way. So God initiates and we acknowledge and then respond. We aren't making a decision for that child. We're not making a decision for that child. We are saying yes to them without condition. We're saying yes to them without condition. Because God said yes to us without condition. And we will love them and pray for them and teach them with every breath that we have. And we want their parents and everyone who loves them to know it. Another example of how those core concepts affect our present experience of faith is what we do today in this act of pledges. It is responsive to the love of God and to the love that God has shown to us, the grace that Christ has bestowed upon us, the belief instilled in us by the Spirit. 
You give because of what the Lord has done, calling you to be mindful disciples looking forward to what God is doing next. And that foundation is what grounds us, and we celebrate that here today. And as we do so, we could not have a better text prepared for us and paired for us when it comes to this experience. Because Jesus, in this text, puts on a one-person clinic on how our understanding of God is made alive through pious action. And for the sake of this conversation, I think it's okay for us to compare Sadducees and Pharisees to leaders of different denominations. It's not exactly the same, but it's the closest we got. There are schools of thought in one faith tradition. They may have thought about the law differently or about the end times differently, but they both would have been considered experts in religious concepts and religious practice. And so the fact that they were spending time challenging an uneducated guy from the sticks says something about the threat that this young Galilean was to their way of life and to their authority. So they wanted to push back on this guy and challenge his understanding of Scripture, his interpretation of the Word. Now, there's over 600 laws in the Torah. So he's got a lot to choose from. Which one is the most important? Now, I don't know what they thought they were in for when they asked that question, but what they got certainly wasn't anything that looked like hesitation or second-guessing or I don't know. Jesus was ready. Love God and love people, Jesus says. That's at the center of what we believe. Everything else springs from that. Hold that for a minute and come back to it. Because that's only part of this passage for this morning. You may need to have it open if you'd like. Because from there, the second part of the passage goes on, because now it's Jesus' t- time to ask a question. He turns around and brings it back on them. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? Now, if you're an expert here, if you're a Pharisee in this situation, this has got to be a decent question. I mean, if you're going to challenge this guy and then he's going to challenge you back, this one's fine. I know the answer to this question because it's the kind of answer that they would have, whatever the equivalent of the children's message, this is like one of those answers, right? Jesus, God, Bible. Like, if you're a kid, you know it's one of those three. This is one of those easy answers. Who is the Messiah? What do you think of him? Oh, he's the son of David. Easy, good, no surprises. But then, of course, from there comes a pivot. He says to them, How is it then that David by the Spirit calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under my feet. If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? Blank stares. With one straightforward question, Jesus is putting everything that they take for granted under debate. And they don't want any part of it. And at this point, I think it might be helpful if we reflect on that for a second. How did we even get to this conversation? Where are we in terms of like this discourse between Jesus and these experts? How did we get here? How are we going back and forth? Go back to the beginning of the chapter just for a second. Chapter 22 is a ramp up to this question and answer. Everything that you read as you're reading from the beginning of the chapter to this end of the chapter is getting us here. So to look at it and to understand it, you have to kind of look back for a second. It starts with that wedding banquet that we heard about a couple of weeks ago that Elizabeth Nicodemus preached on. It starts there. And all of that discourse, all of that parable, really comes down to trying to answer one question. 
Whether you are the powerful or the voiceless, what does it mean for you to live justly and righteously in the world? Right? There's that whole engagement with who's coming and who's not and why they're not coming and whether the people who came came correct or any of those things, all of that is answered, right? It's all about that kind of righteous action and how the person who's in charge of it treats those people who are there. And then it leads us into a discussion about paying taxes, starting in verse 15, paying taxes. Which again, basically comes down to the same answer. How are we going to live righteously in the world given the way the world is. And from there, he starts to answer questions, not about now, because all of those are about the here and now, but then he starts to answer things about the end times. He goes from here to the end times. And when the Sadducees try asking him some obscure, convoluted question about marriage and how it works a few verses before, He puts all of that back on them and he makes sure that they understand that their understanding of Scripture is just out out in left field. So finally, after feeling all of those inquiries about this life and the one to come, he lets people know by what authority he is saying all these things. Because you can say a whole bunch of stuff and you can give people answers to things, but if they don't have any reason to believe you or to think that you know what you're talking about, then they're going to at some point dismiss you. And since he doesn't have a seminary degree, he doesn't have a position in a synagogue or even a permanent address for that matter, He has to try to connect the dots for them. If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? Answer. He could be David's son and David's Lord if he is also the eternal son of God. A reality that would change their lives and our lives forever. So he gets them from how they should be acting, where things are going, why it is that he can say this, and then he finds a way to tie it all together and point back to himself so they understand where he led them. Every bit of time that I spent in seminary and every moment that you have spent in these pews, everything that has ever been said in any of these confessions are virtual kind of electrons around the nucleus of the same idea. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. To understand that and faithfully pursue it, we need every second and every word that we can muster. The victims of violence in the Middle East and now in Maine would not be interested in our denominational leanings. And five years later, those who grieve the victims at the Tree of Life aren't either. The only thing that matters is how we take all of that history and all of that learning and apply it to the commands that Jesus points us to. As our hearts break, so must our pride. And as our prayers rise, so must our empathy. Because that is what we are called to in response to the world that we exist in. And so my prayer for us is that we would be changed and always be changing. And that we may pledge our lives to love. May we love each other with a mindfulness that we are all headed towards a world made new and made better because of who we put our trust in. May it be so for you and for me. And to God be the glory this day and forevermore. Amen. In a moment as we uh, rise to sing our hymn 428, that is when uh, you can bring your uh, dedication of pledges up.
uh, and then we'll say a prayer afterwards before the affirmation of faith. If you didn't receive a prayer card for whatever reason, uh, we have them here. Uh, you can certainly add them um, to this later, uh, but so please don't fret about that. Um, but if all are ready, we are ready. pray together. Holy and loving God, you have been there for us from the beginning and now and always. So we pledge to you all that we have, all that we are, all that we can. We're thankful for the community that guides us and loves us. We're thankful for the ways that we can come together in unity. We're thankful for the ways that you continue to hold us strong and to give us wisdom. We ask in this coming year that you would continue to build us up, that you would continue to open our eyes and ears to new opportunities to serve. I thank you for all those who dedicate themselves to this place and to your work. And we pray all of these things in Christ's name. Amen. As we continue to stand together now, we affirm our faith using the Scot a portion of the Scots Confession. Let us say this together. As we believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, so we firmly believe that from the beginning there has been, now is, and to the end of the world shall be, one curse. That is to say, one company in multitude of people chosen by God, who rightly worship and embrace him by true faith in Christ Jesus, who is the only head of the curtain, even as it is the body and spouse of Christ Jesus. The Kirk is Catholic, that is, universal, because it contains the chosen of all ages, of all realms and nations and tongues, be they of Jews to be they of the Gentiles, who have communion in society with God the Father, and with the Son, Christ Jesus, through the sanctification of his Holy Spirit. Please be seated. So I ask again, as I do weekly, what are we praying for this morning? 
Let me uh, start with the folks on this side. Moving to the folks here in the middle. Yes, Kaylers. For Denise, certainly. For Denise and for Sandy. Okay. Uh, yes. Well, we love you too, and we're we're uh, hope that you can you can send us postcards or pictures of what it is like to have sun, because uh, we are about to lose it forever. Uh, so, uh, we, uh, we we're glad that you are here in this season, and we pray for you as you go. Yes, madam. Peggy Meister. For Dr. Robert Conti, who is fighting illness. Thank you. Are there others here or elsewhere? Yes, Gwen. Say it one more time. For the Acker family on the loss of Joe's son. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. This side. Yes, sir. For the innocent people of uh, I'm sorry, I interrupt you. I didn't mean to. Uh, Israel and Palestine. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Other others, others we didn't mention. Let us pray together. Our burdens, O oh God, can seem heavy because they are. Your strength keeps us moving forward. We are thankful not only that we can give the weight of what we bear to you, but that we also don't walk alone. We walk arm in arm and hand in hand, praying for a world that is in desperate need of compassion. All we can ask is that you would continue to knock on the doors of our hearts, that you would continue to nudge us in the directions of empathy, that you would continue to show us what we need to see so that our prayer is rightly and justly something that compels us t towards righteous action. And we pray that our lawmakers, we pray that our nation, we pray that each our neighbors would continue to find new ways of loving each other. That we would be those who raise our hands, who say yes to how we can be helpful in the world. And that seems overwhelming. And perhaps it's small conversations, perhaps it's being quiet when we would otherwise say something. Maybe it's saying something when we would otherwise be quiet. And that discernment should be led by those greatest commandments of loving you and of loving each other. So we ask you this morning to continue to fill our hearts and minds with your word. Show us who we are. And we know that we can find those answers because of who your son has been and is and will always be. So we pray now the prayer that he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now, if the ushers will please come forward, we'll receive this morning's offer.
God, we thank you for this time and place. We thank you for the giving hearts that surround me. We ask that you would continue to show us your ways. You would continue to bind us together. Give us hearts of compassion. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Friends, just a few things before I give you the benediction. Uh, first, 
Um, there are Stephen ministers among you. Uh, we have uh, Sue Swick who will be up here. She's trying to get down from the choir, so give her a second. And uh, we also have doing wellness calls this week is Jean the Dream Eckert, and she's going to be taking those calls. So if you have anything that you need to report back to us uh, about folks who are in need, uh, she will take those calls, and her information is there in the bulletin. Uh, also, if, there, if you are on the nominating committee, there is a nominating committee meeting, uh, a short one after the service. Uh, people will probably need to get something from downstairs and yada, yada, yada. We will eventually be in the library, uh, and so we'll have a short meeting there to kind of get our, ourselves organized. Uh, also, uh, again, there is fellowship uh, downstairs, and so I will uh, s simply ask that you are, uh, that you, who, wait, who's in charge of it? Staff Relations Committee is in charge of it. So Bob Kaler just left. And I think, I think he just door dashed McDonald's. So it's gonna be, it's gonna be interesting, because my guess is he just remembered. Uh, no, I'm just, I'm just joking, I'm joking. I, uh, I love this job, I really, really do. And, um, not only because I get flowers whenever uh, it's Pastor Appreciation Month, but because um, I get to invest in the lives of people in this community. And then I think about the ways that your lives and the ways that you, um, what you do here, what I watch you do here, how I watch you interact, how that has a direct effect on the community around us, the neighbors that you have, the people that you know, uh, the folks at the Westview Hub, w the 319 churches, whatever it happens to be. I watch that happen over and over and over again. And I marvel at it. And the only way that we can really embrace our history and embrace, embrace the, our, our, our pledge to this place, however, we, however you think of it, however we embrace the, in, the intensity and intentionality that we have for our churches really comes down to the ways that we understand who we are at our core. And, this, and the passages that we have here for this morning get to that so succinctly. And it is always going to be a challenge to try to understand how we engage the core of who we are in the world. But thankfully, we never do that by ourselves. But we always go forward arm in arm to understand the world as it is and to understand our place in it with the faith and the love of the one who creates us and redeems us and sustains us now and always. Amen. Amen.